Hello and welcome to our lecture on wastewater treatment. This is actually the second part of a series where we cover tertiary or advanced treatment and activated sludge. In the first part, we covered the primary or pretreatment and secondary treatment. So what are our, our objectives for today? First, we're going to identify typical advanced treatment and activated sludge systems. Then we're going to design a filtration system. This is an example of a trickling filter system. And you'll see these throughout the United States, although not very, very uh, common in New York City, as you can see, because it takes up so much area. Let's talk about, again, what the major components of a wastewater treatment system are. Now, we've already covered the pretreatment, which would be your bar screen of removing your larger materials, and then the grit chamber, which removes more of the particles that are about the size of sand. And again, this, the entire treatment of the bar, bar screen and the grit chamber, this is all mechanically removing the organics or materials that we don't want in our system. After primary treatment, we moved into secondary treatment, in which case this is more of a biological system in which, where we use good bacteria to consume the organics and the bad bacteria that we no longer want to keep in our flow. Today, we're going to look at tertiary or a third, again, tertiary meaning the third type of treatment, which we often call an advanced treatment because not everybody uses it. And we'll look at items such as nutrient removal, chlorine contact for disinfection. And we're also going to talk about the sludge digester. We've never spoke about it before, but what happens to all of that solid material that we remove? So again, tertiary treatment, the main purpose is to remove any material that we have not been able to do so, so far. And that's usually through the process of another clarification, so again, another type of, another round of settling, and also disinfection. Typically what we remove are the suspended solids, minerals, and metals. So again, much more fine material or material on the more molecular level. And our major components are filters, disinfection tanks, and air stripping, which again is another process of removing any gases that we don't want in our system. So what are some typical filter functions? The three that we cover in our textbook, the first is a granular media filter, and granular think sand. So again, typically we're talking a, a sand filter, and let me get out my highlighter here. And that could be sand in addition to coal. If you can think of a Brita filter, Brita filters you use coals, which also remove additional odors and materials and minerals, and also carbon. Another type of filter is called the roughing filter. And this is typically when you have a strong or variable organic load. And you typically use a synthetic media, so not something that's sand. You'd use more like a small plastic. Last but not least is the trickling filter. And this is typically found in areas where we have a large amount of area. So again, as you can see, if you have a lot of real estate available to you, you can have multiple trickling filter tanks. Again, we don't see this often in New York City for the simple reason that real estate is very expensive here and we don't have the space. But if you simply go maybe to say northern New York State or just out of the state, this is very common. And especially for older plants that have still this type of treatment, you will encounter it. Now, there are some other types of filter materials. I'm just leaving this here for your information. This is um, according to the 10 state standards, or the GLRM, which again stands for Great Lakes Upper Mississippi River Board. That's our piece right here. Grab my highlighter for you. So again, that's your GLRM or 10 state standards. And again, these are just types of filters that you can consider. It's not something you would be responsible for in this course but more just for, your, just for your information, that there's different types of filters that you could use depending on what you're trying to do. Maybe if you only want one type of filtration, if you have high pressure, if you're using a gravity filter, again, it all depends. So we're going to move on to trickling filters in particular, again, just so that we can do an example and go through some of the properties. If you can think of, a, say, a sprinkler that would use on your lawn, Flip it upside down, so instead of sprinkling up, it sprinkles down directly. And often what you see, you can see this here would be a granular media, so maybe gravel 
or maybe a synthetic plastic. And what happens is as the water trickles through, let me see if I can grab a, a pen here. So as the water makes its way through the gravel media, any organic material start to be consumed by a biofilm that develops on the top. And this is something you would look like an algae. So again, if we can draw something that looks algae-like on top, to the best of my ability here, and it's shown in the darker red. The algae will consume any organic material as the water trickles down. And that's where we get the name trickling media filter. So it will trickle down to the bottom of the tank. And at the bottom of the tank here, there'll be a collection area which will take away the more clarified effluent and bring it to more of the final stages of treatment, which is often maybe chlorination. So let's do an example problem with properties that we know. So for example, number one, we have a trickling filter plant that has an 85-foot diameter trickling filter, and that it's seven feet deep filled with a stone. And then after that, there's a secondary clarifier, so there's another settling tank process, essentially, that's 50 feet in diameter and seven feet deep. There's a flow that moves through the, the entire plant of 1.38 millions of gallons per day. And there's an initial effluent of 100, I'm sorry, initial um, BOD, so again, a biochemical oxygen demand of 180 milligrams per liter. Now, one thing we're asked to assume is that we're asked to assume a recirculation ratio of 50% between the trickling filter and the secondary clarifier, and also a removal of 35% previously of the BOD in primary treatment. And then after the secondary, after the tertiary treatment, secondary and tertiary, I should say, 85% is removed. Let me see if I could give us a little diagram here change up our colors. So initially, we have our secondary clarifier, which goes to our trickling filter, which is a bit larger. So just to draw what we have here. So we have our initial flow in of Q. We have our flow out of Q. We also, in between the tanks, there's technically Q. But there is this additional 50% that keeps recirculating. So we'll say this is 0.5 Q. To the best of my ability, let's draw that. There we go. So really, if you think about it, when you're looking at your secondary clarifier, it experiences the original, the, the, the original flow of Q plus half, half of that flow coming back in. So again, there's this half of, half of a Q that's constantly recirculating in. And what we're asked to find is we're asked to find the overflow rate for the trickling filter, as well as the BOD removal, and then the uh, detention time overflow rate and weir overflow rate for the clarifier. So let's look at it. So again, because of the trickling filter, we have Q plus a recirculation, a recirculation of um, R plus Q, R times Q, excuse me. So again, we have the full Q that goes into the tank plus a recirculation ratio of 50%. So again, going back, you have the Q going in plus you have that half Q constantly recirculating through back into your trickling filter. So if we look at our calculation, let me bring that down for you. All righty, and let's go through that. Let me just fix. Good, now we'll set. So we have our original flow of 1.38 millions of gallons per day plus our recirculation ratio of 50%. Now, if you want, you can immediately combine this to 1.5 times 1.38 millions of gallons per day. That would totally make it easy. The area, the surface area, I should say, of the trickling filter 
is, the, is a circle. So it's pi d, our diameter is 85 feet squared, divided by 4. And then since, since we typically use units of an acre, so millions of gallons per day per acre of plant, or per acre of trickling filter, I have my conversion rate right here. Again, there's one acre, or 43,560 square feet. When you do your calculation, you should end up with 15.9 millions of gallons per day per acre. Now, if we look at our BOD, bring this down, have this all as one line for you, so we'll just leave that. So the BOD loading, initially, you want to look at your flow times your loading rate, and then you divide it by the volume. Now, since this is the volume of a cylinder, essentially, it's the area times the height of the tank. So we have our flow of 1.38 millions of gallons per day because that's what's moving through the entire system. You don't want to use the recirculation ratio here. We have our removal load of 117. Now, where did that come from? Now, go back. Remember, 35% has been removed during primary clarification. So that means the original 180 milligrams per liter that came in, remove 35% from that. Or multiply 180 by 0.65. And that's how you get 117. Again, you have the area of your trickling filter times the depth. And also, again, a lot of these are just typical units for how we express information in environmental engineering. So it may seem a little unusual, but typically we like to talk about load in how many pounds of oxygen demand are required per day. So we have a conversion rate here of how many pounds are equal to gallons times milligram per liter. So again, I know a lot of these seem very unusual, and technically we're even mixing units between English and metric. But again, this is more of a, a very unique area of engineering, so I'm just going to ask you guys to bear with me, and this is the, the unit, how the units go. So again, this piece here is purely a conversion factor, so that you can express it solely as the amount of weight, which is 0.034 pounds of biochemical oxygen demand required or removed per day. So that took care of our first two items. So again, the problem asked for the overflow rate, as well as the BOD removal load for the trickling filter. And now let's find the properties for the secondary clarifier. So first, let's look at the overflow rate. So again, it's just the flow divided by the area. We have a total, ooh, my apologies, we're missing a zero there. Let's throw an extra zero in that right there. We have 1.38 or 1,380,000 gallons per day. Divide that by the cross-sectional area of the secondary clarifier, which has an area of 50 feet squared, divided by 4 times pi, and that gives us a straight answer of 705 gallons per day for every foot squared of tank. Now let's look at the detention time. So how long does the effluent remain in the tank? And again, you're, we're just rearranging flow is equal to volume over time. So we have the volume of the tank as area times depth. And then again, we have our conversion factor to go in back and forth between gallons and cubic feet. So there's 7.48 gallons for every cubic foot. Divide that by our Q. So again, I don't know why we keep missing a zero there. Let's add that back in. There we go. So we have, again, 1.38 million gallons per day. And typically, we don't express how long um, the effluent remains in the filtering tank in days, because then that would be a very small number. We typically refer to it in hours, since our design values are typically in hours. So there's one day for 24 hours. When you cancel out your units and solve, you get 1.8 hours. So that's the total amount of time it remains in that secondary clarifier. And then last but not least, our weir loading rate is Q divided by this area, but this is the, I'm not, excuse me, the area, the circumference, because that would be, and again, just as a reminder, hold on 
on one second. Just want to show a, a quick reminder. So then if I draw a tank, the weirs were assumed to be peripheral. So that means they're all along the edge of the tank as it overflows. So what's happening, again, just as a reminder, is that the flow goes over, it literally overflows over the tank and collect it outside of the bottom of the tank. So again, we're looking at more the circumference when we're talking about more of a linear distance of an area. So we have Q, again, still missing that zero, put it back. Clearly, I copied and pasted, and that's why I kept missing a zero. Divided by pi times the diameter to give me the circumference. And that gives me a weir loading of 880 gallons per day for every linear foot of weir. So again, just a sense of what type of efficiency we're having there. Now that we've talked about the different types of clarification that happen in advanced treatments, such as we're removing some of the nutrients, now we're going to talk about chlorine or disinfection. And look, what are some other types of minerals that we'll need to remove? We talked a little bit, we mentioned this concept of air stripping. And the idea is that we use air to either decrease or increase acidity and also to convert different types of either uh, liquids or gases into other forms. So one particular example is to convert ammonia into gas. So what happens here is we typically have air in. So the air comes in. We have our effluent or influent, excuse me. Our influent comes in. The air is forced up through different types of media filters. And what happens is that reaction of the air and the water, again, that aeration, causes the ammonia to convert to gas. And these different types of processes are called nitrification and denitrification. Again, I recognize this is not a chemistry course, but again, I want you to recognize these different terms. And again, this is just showing a simple reaction of how you would end up going from, say, a nitrate, I'm sorry, from a nitrite to a nitrate. And again, you want more of, uh, to convert everything into a nitrogen gas. And the reason why is because nitrogen gas is inert. It's not something we need to be concerned about. So our end goal is nitrogen gas. More importantly, something that I do want you to be aware of is that the primary means of disinfecting our water is typically through chlorine. And again, you're probably aware of this because if you've ever been to a pool, you would smell the chlorine. And the purpose of that is, again, to kill or to essentially destroy any of the pathogens that could harm us. Now, the only thing is, after you add chlorine, you need to remove it because that's not something we should consume. Again, we shouldn't be consuming chlorine because any of the living organisms in our body, as well as ourselves, because we're a living organism, would be uh, negatively affected by chlorine. So again, it's the same reason why you don't drink bleach. How could you remove chlorine? Typically, we use, it, we use sulfur dioxide as a reaction to, um, to make the chlorine inactive so, it's not, so that it does not negatively affect us. Now, we've talked about, we're moving through these topics very quickly, actually. We've talked about nutrient removal. How do we get rid of additional minerals, um, additional organics, and any type of suspended solids that have not yet been removed? And we said we did that using trickling filters, media filters, and then we moved on to chlorine, because oftentimes there's still pathogens that exist. We may remove a large percentage of those pathogens, but in the very end, we need to destroy any remaining ones so that we aren't negatively affected. But again, something we haven't talked about along the way is that throughout the process, we've had solids that we've been removing, either from primary treatment or secondary treatment. And actually, sometimes even in tertiary treatment, we may have an additional settling tank. So we have this what we call sludge, and not, not, the, not the prettiest name, but it, it suits the term. Again, this is all of the organic material, again, more the larger organic material that is removed. What happens to it? So a variety of things happen depending on usually where, where you are in the country or in the world. So again, after each of the processes, primary, secondary, and tertiary, 
you can still have sludge. And how it's treated, again, oftentimes because it's highly organic, it has a very strong odor. So oftentimes we'll have an odor control. And there's additional pathogen control so that perhaps we could use it for a more effective purpose, such as landfilling. We could also distribute it for, say, you know, very basic um, uh, agricultural purposes, maybe such as grasses or things that, depending on the quality of the sludge and how safe it is, could it be recycled back for, for human, human use eventually. Now, some things that we no longer are able to do in the United States is to, is to dump our waste into the ocean. Now, while some other countries may do this, this is something that is against the law in the United States. There are still some places in the United States that allow for incineration where the waste is actually burned. But unfortunately, that um, the, the product of what goes into the air, again, these particles and all of the particles that have been incinerated now go into the air. And again, that can affect the air quality, which can affect the health of the people who live in the area. So that's not something that's typically allowed to be done in the United States, or in, the, in New York City, I should say, anymore. And typically what happens with the final sludge, a large volume is actually water. So we have to remove a majority of the water before we can do something more uh, efficient with it. Because otherwise, if you think about it, when you think about how do you, dis when you dispose of something, if you often pay by the weight, so why would you want to pay for water? So oftentimes what we do is we remove the water so that we can reduce the volume and possibly the mass, again, if some, some of the items might turn more to an ash. So some things that we'll do is we'll thicken, condition, dewater, and dry. Again, these are more advanced topics that if we went into more deeply the concept of activated sludge, we would discuss more. But I just want you to be aware that we actually take that waste and we purposely try to remove as much water as possible so that we're not paying to ship water somewhere else. We're paying just for the waste that we're trying to remove. Now, what I would find to be a really interesting study um, is the Ward's Island Treatment Plant. What I'd ask you to do, this is a very short video, in preparation for, our, for the field trips that you may go on, either to Red Hook or to the Newtown Creek, this is one of the treatment plants I'd like you to look at. And also, especially if you have a quiz, you might want to know some of these questions. So again, look for these four questions in this video. Prior to the construction of treatment plants, sludge used to be dumped into, actually you might know this one already, we just discussed it, and it's no longer available, you're not allowed to do it anymore. Second, dumping first occurred as close as how many miles off of the New York City shoreline? And this area was known as the mud dump. Sadly enough, this actually did not stop that long ago, so many of you might actually know of it. Ocean dumping was outlawed in what year? Again, not as far away as you may think. At Ward's Island, a blank is used to dewater the sludge, and thicken agents are added to create a cake. So again, the idea is that you want to remove as much water as possible so it doesn't weigh as much, so it's easier and cheaper to ship. The picture that we have here, this is actually one of the, the barges that remove the waste from the plant. So this is a DEP boat that will go remove the waste and then bring it to, say, um, an area where there's trucks for a landfill. We'll talk a little bit of that, about a few, a few other processes, such as mixed liquor suspended solids. What does that mean? Some other terms that we're looking at are ways to quantify this sludge that we have when we're done. So again, the mixed liquor suspended solids, or the MLFS, are the waste solids and the biomass that are formed. And we, we're typically trying to quantify how much of this mass are we trying to break down. So in order to do that, in order to break down these organics, we need to have enough biomass or enough, say, on the trickling filter, for example. There needs to be enough biomass on the granular media so that the good bacteria can eat the either the organics or the pathogens that we don't want. So essentially, how much food do we need to provide this good bacteria so that they stay healthy and that they continually are able to break down 
um, again, those organics and uh, pathogens we don't want. So in order to find that out, we calculate a food to microorganism ratio, or an FM ratio. And the FM ratio is equal to the flow that's coming in, how much oxygen is in the system. Again, you need oxygen in order to break down, break down organisms. What is the volume of the tank? And what is the amount of mixed liquor suspended solids that we need to break down? So let's do an example. So here we have an example of an activated sludge system where we're trying to break down the, the, the pathogens and the, the other bacteria. So we have a conventional activated sludge plant without primary clarification that has a flow of 2.14 gal millions of gallons per day. So again, we have our influ 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 influent coming into an aeration basin. So we have our 2.14 millions of gallons per day that eventually move to a clarifier. And that influent has a BOD of 185 milligrams per liter and a mixed liquor suspended solids of 2,600 2, milligrams per liter. That's quite a bit because, again, we're talking literally the, literally the mass that we want to break down. In that, this particular example, there are four aeration tanks. This, this image only shows two. And those four aeration tanks are 40 feet wide, 40 feet long, and 15 feet deep. So again, I recognize this is more rectangular where the example problem is square. And the question asks, determine the food to mass ratio. So again, if we look at our formula of flow, BOD, divided by volume of tank times mixed liquor suspended solids. Let's move our, our calculations here. So we have our Q. I wrote it out as the full 2,140,000 gallons per day. Our BOD of 185 milligrams per liter. The total volume of all the tanks. So we have four tanks. 40 feet long, 40 feet wide, 15.5 feet deep. Again, we typically will use uh, cubic feet, so we want to make sure everything cancels. So we'll say 7.48 gallons per day per foot cube. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, gallons per foot cubed, so that we can convert everything into feet. Then we have our mixed, li mixed liquor suspended solids value of 2,600 milligrams per liter. When we do our calculations and cancel everything out, we're left with simply 0 .2, 0.21, our BOD per day, so again, in the gallons per day, the day stays, it does not cancel, divided by the mixed liquor suspended solids. Now, technically, in the formula, it doesn't actually say BOD and MLSS. All this would cancel down to is 0 0.21 per day. But that doesn't mean anything to us, 0.21 what per day. So what it actually means, and you can add in pounds per pound because you can add in any version, multiply by any version of one. You can even say newtons per newton, grams per gram, but since we're in English units, we'll use pounds per pound. What it actually means is 0.21 pounds of BOD per day is needed for every one pound of mixed liquor suspended solids. And I'll say that one more time, just because a lot of the units cancel, but it doesn't really give us any meaning. So we often express it as 0.21 pounds of BOD required every day for every one pound of mixed liquor suspended solids. Again, just to give you a sense of what quantity of the BOD we need in order to feed our good bacteria to break down our organics. That's quite a mouthful. So what are some things you can do with sludge? Hopefully you can actually turn it into something useful. Now, quite a few companies have, are very entrepreneurial and they've recognized that, hey, here's something that people are throwing away. There's got to be something useful that we can do with it. So what I'd like you to do is now watch this four minute video about how you can turn sludge or this biomass into something usable at the end, such as fertilizer. So the first question says, in blank, the largest sludge recycling plant opened in the Bronx. So what year was that? Second, 
The New York Organic Fertilizer Company uses a rotary dryer to destroy pathogens and create pellets of what? And then the last question is, who uses these pellets? What do they do? So again, probably worthwhile just in case it happens to appear on a quiz. So one of our last topics, again, just more to bring this to you, to your attention. And actually, you're probably well aware of it. When you took fluid mechanics, we talked about different types of typical pipe materials. Now, at the time, we just focused on water, again, just homogeneous water. But many of these pipe materials are also used for sewer systems. Some of them we even briefly discussed a little bit, if you remember, either for you probably last semester. Now, typically, the two methods of conveying, conveying sewage are either gravity, which is very, very common. We want to make use of gravity as often as possible. And then where we have to lift it up to a higher elevation, we pressurize it. Oftentimes, we pressurize the flow to go from a lower elevation up to a higher elevation, usually at a treatment plant. And then we send it through another gravity system. So some typical pipe material, ductile iron. Often, I, I remember we talked about this last semester. Again, ductile iron is typically very large diameter, very tough, but it corrodes over time. Cast iron is typically used for building connections. Vitrified clay pipe is resistant to corrosion, but again, similar to ductile iron, can be very brittle. Concrete is high strength, but is also susceptible corrosion because we have that hydrogen sulfide. Again, part of the, the, the gases or the products that are part of waste. So sometimes that's not always the best material. PVC is not conductive. So again, it doesn't conduct heat. It doesn't conduct electricity. It resists corrosion, but also can deflect excessively because it's, it's very ductile. So again, may not be good for under, under the ground if we're expecting very high loads that may actually end up um, causing the, the excessive deformation and possibly cracking and leaking. Last is ABS. This is a composite of plastic and concrete. And in, this was more in an effort to combat the problem of too much deflection from PVC. So again, it deflects less than PVC. So again, just a summary of different types of pipe materials you might encounter. Now, last but not least, what are some typical sewer design characteristics? Now, this is very, very high level. Again, just a really brief summary. But many of these things you actually know from open channel flow in fluid mechanics last semester. So again, flows are typically within the range of 50 to 140 gallons per, per capita day, which means, again, per person. And like we said, New York City is often on the higher end of that, again, more closer to 200 gallons per day per capita, which is tremendously high. Peak factors are typically used in the range of, say, 1.3 to 3.5. We'll multiply that by whatever our average flow is so that we can be prepared so that when we have our really high demands, we're ready for it. Minimum velocity is 2 feet per second. And the reason why is we want to make sure that we don't have too much settling on the way to the treatment plant. We want to make sure that there's, it constantly is cleaning out any type of uh, particulate material so that it gets to the treatment plant. Now, in the reverse, we typically look at a maximum of 20 feet per second because we don't want, say, that gritty material or the particulate to, to move so fast past the pipe or along the inner diameter of the pipe that it literally causes it to wear away. And then how do you actually design a pipe size diameter and slope? We use Manning's equation. So again, it's something you're very familiar with. So again, we typically are looking at English units. So it's 1.49 times the hydraulic radius raised to the 2 thirds times the energy line or the energy slope divided by Manning's friction factor. So now what are you left with to do? So please make sure you do quiz number nine and homework number nine. Homework number nine is more of the secondary treatment. And so make sure you move on to that. And also, you're working on your wastewater treatment plant. Thank you. And if you have, again, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Take care.